welcome to our webinar series, Succeeding with Forecast Pro. In today's webinar, we're going to focus on the topic of overrides. Hello and welcome. My name is James Berry, and I am the Director of Training at Forecast Pro. I've been with the company now over 20 years and have helped hundreds of different companies learn how to use Forecast Pro. And in today's webinar, I hope to teach you some of the tips and tricks that help you to succeed with the system. Now first, let's go over a couple of housekeeping notes. The first is that this webinar series, Succeeding with Forecast Pro, is run once every quarter. Our next webinar will be in November and we will be discussing events. We will post a link to sign up for that webinar at the end of this one. Also, this video will be recorded and we will post this webinar up on our website so you can download it later and share it with others. Now we are using Zoom for this webinar. As such, there is a chat button at the bottom of your Zoom window that you can use to post any questions. So as we go, if you have any questions, please use the chat functionality to post them. My colleague Franklin is monitoring those, and at the end of today's session, we will try to answer all questions. In terms of an agenda for today, we're going to start with an overview discussing how overrides work within Forecast Pro. Then we will dive into a few examples within Forecast Pro, where we'll walk you through how to use the override functionality to its fullest extent. We will wrap up with some conclusions and some thoughts. And then finally, as discussed, we will take your questions at the end. So now let's dive into this webinar. Now let's discuss an overview of overrides and collaboration. In discussions with our Forecast Pro users, everyone gets feedback from at least one, and in most cases, multiple sources of information. This information is helpful for generating the best, most accurate forecast possible. Some of this information coming in will directly affect the final forecasts. But in other instances, this information is helpful when viewed against the forecast, as well as in calculations to come to a final consensus forecast. Now everyone's situation is different. For example, you might work in a team where multiple people work directly within Forecast Pro and make overrides and adjustments together as a team. In another scenario, you might be in charge of Forecast Pro and you will receive feedback from multiple sources, whether that be management, sales, operations, or finance, and it's your job to consolidate all of this information into Forecast Pro and come up with a final consensus forecast. Now whatever your setup, you will be using the override grid to accomplish this, so let's take a look at this in detail. When you receive information from these sources and you want them to directly affect the final forecast, here you will enter overrides directly. In the tool, you can have up to 10 override rows, and these rows are usually named after people or groups of people that you're receiving this information from. So you will enter their adjustments directly into this override grid, and they will affect the final forecast. Now, how you get that information in can come from multiple sources. You can either type these overrides in directly, you can import them in from an outside source, or you could be using our built-in Excel collaboration function in order to get these overrides directly into the override grid. Now, in addition to just direct overrides in the override grid, we have additional rows of information that can help you when making these adjustments. These include the history rows, which can appear above the statistical forecast. Then there are four types of extra rows that can help us with these. They are the conversion rows, external data rows, calculated rows, and system rows. Let's take a look at each of these four individually and discuss how they are used. We'll begin with the conversion rows. With the conversion rows, we can change to different units of measure. By far the most common is currency. So that whether you were changing this to dollars or euros, this way we can see the data in both units and in currency. Another common conversion would be into weight, whether into pounds or kilos, if that was how your data is measured. Or when folks are doing manufacturing, you can think of them as length, whether that's linear feet or meters. 
And if you're working on some sort of shipping problem or inventory problem, converting into pallets or containers can sometimes be a good conversion as well. Next, we'll look at the external data rows. With external data rows, these are rows of information that do not directly affect the final forecast, but I want to compare side by side with my forecast, both in the override grid as well as in the graph. Some common types of external data we would look at would be open orders. How many orders do we have in this current month or the months going forward? If we're talking to finance, they may load in a financial forecast or an annual plan that we could have going forward. If we wanted to look at actual prices over time, we can load this in. If sales talks directly to your customers and they give you direct forecasts, you might want to incorporate a customer forecast in here. And finally, if you have back orders, we might want to look at those as well. Next, we'll look at the calculated rows. Now with all of this information, with the conversions, as well as the external data, we might want to then use that information and build calculations off of those. A common example would be to create a custom KPI formula. For instance, to look at the difference between our current forecast and say an outside forecast, like a customer forecast. We can also do what if scenarios. So what if we added 5% on top of our current forecast? What would that look like? This could then be used to establish a different baseline forecast where we're doing our own calculation to come up with our own final forecast. Or if you wanted to create conversions off of external rows, we can do that with the calculated rows as well. And finally, let's discuss the system rows. There are two types of system rows built into Forecast Pro. There's previous forecasts and integer rounding. The previous forecasts will display your forecast from the previous month, the previous two months, etc. This can be very helpful when looking at differences in our current forecast and say what we looked at last month. Now these are not a replacement for our forecast accuracy reports. They are more a useful option that we have available to us when making adjustments. The second type of system row is integer rounding. This allows us to look at data as whole numbers, but in a different rounded way. This is especially useful for extremely low volume data, and we will look at some examples of this later on. So the key thing here is that we have lots of different options when it comes to these additional rows. And we want to be able to load in any kind of additional information that will help us when making our overrides directly. Now let's look at some examples within Forecast Pro. We're going to look at four distinct examples. First, a budget comparison. Second, an integer conversion. Third, we'll look at an example showing open orders. And finally, we will do a year-over-year -year comparison. In our first example, we're going to do a budget comparison. We are going to compare a financial forecast that we loaded in as external data to our own forecast converted into dollars using our conversion rows. Let's take a look at this in Forecast Pro. Okay, so here in Forecast Pro, you can see I've loaded in our auto parts data. And in my override grid, I have loaded in our two extra rows. I have my conversion row, which is converting into dollars. And then I have our external data row, which has loaded in our financial plan for 2024. You can see it covers partially into the historical data starting in January of 2024 and going partially into the future, going through December of 2024. So it's covering the entire year. If I look at our override grid settings, you can see these two rows are in here. I have my conversion row in dollars and I have my external row with my financial plan in here. You can also see that I've included these two rows in the graph where I have our dollars here as this purple line and then I have our financial plan here as these bars. In addition to just viewing this information, we can also use it to make overrides. 
If we look at August, we can see that our forecast in dollars is for $962,000, but that our financial plan is for $1.15 million. If we were talking to management and they said, we actually need to boost this number up and make it at least $1.1 million, well, how would we do that? We'd go ahead and click on our conversion row, and you can then see in the value box, it says 962,000. We're gonna go ahead and change that to 1.1 million. We're then going to change the row to put this into management uh, row and go ahead and click on the value button. You'll see it makes our change here in units. I'll then go ahead and type in my comment. So I'll click on this cell. And most important, whenever making overrides, you always wanna make a comment. Set to $1.1 million. And you'll see that our forecast has now adjusted in both units and in dollars to match this change. So being able to bring in conversions and external data in multiple units as a point of comparison can be very helpful when making reviews and overrides. Now in our second example, we're going to look at an integer conversion. Here what we will do is we will actually create our own custom conversion row where we will multiply price times our integer forecast to convert the integer forecast into dollars. Let's take a look at this in Forecast Pro. Okay, now in this example, what we've loaded in are two things. Our system row, which is our integer forecast. So this is a different round for our data. And we've loaded in an external row, which is price, which is price per item per month. And you can see in our pricing, it has changed over time. So it went from 46.50 to 48.25 to $51. And when we do conversions, we actually can't convert the integer forecast. So what we can do is we can instead create a calculated row where we will multiply our pricing per month times our integer forecast to get a conversion into dollars. This is especially useful when you have a lot of low volume data sets. So how we're gonna do this is I'm simply going to right click on the price row and I'm going to add a row. So this will add a calculated row. Now when creating a calculated row, I have to specify whether I want it to be global or item specific. In this case, I want it to be global. I want this formula to be applied to all of my items. And I'm going to give this calculated row a name. I'm gonna expand this row here so you can see my formulas typing in. And what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to say equals my integer forecast times my pricing. I'm gonna go ahead and say okay and you'll see it will convert these. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this formula and paste it all the way across my forecast. Go ahead and commit this. Now, because this was a global calculated field, you'll see no matter which customer I go to, it will have this calculation done for me. Now, I do want to change the formatting of this if I'm going to have a formula like this. So I'm gonna go up to my override grid and go to our settings. You can see I have my global calculated row. I wanna set a couple of things. First, I wanna change this from a number to currency because this is in dollars. I want this to show up in dollars. Second, I'm going to go to my row properties. I'm going to make sure that this is calculated at the bottom level of my hierarchy because that's where I want it to go. I do want it to aggregate up. I want it to roll up to all of my higher levels. And I wanna pin this not to my date but instead to my column. What's the difference? When you create a formula, if it's pinned to the date, it will move with that date over time. So my formula for August of 2024 will move in with August as it goes. When you create a global calculation like this that covers the entire forecast period, I would rather pin this to a column. By pinning to a column, this formula will stay and cover the entire forecast period. Each month that I come back and generate a new forecast, this will recalculate and again cover the entire forecast period. So if I'm creating a calculated row that's going to cover the entire forecast period, I'd want to pin to column. If I want it to move through time, I would pin it to date. So I'm gonna go ahead and pin it to column and say okay. And now you can see I have my formula. It's converting everything into dollars. 
It rolls up my hierarchy just as I would like it to. So all of this is here as shown in dollars, and this will cover my entire forecast period even as I move through time. So once again, I can create my own custom conversions on outside data sources if I load in a pricing field as an external data row. In our third example, we're going to do an open orders comparison. We're going to load in open orders as an external data row, and then we're gonna create a calculated row that will take the maximum of either our statistical forecast or our open orders, whichever one is greater. So let's take a look at this. Now in this example, we're going to compare our open orders, which I have loaded in as an external row, and our final forecast. We can see this here in the override grid. I have also put it on the graph where our current forecast is in red and our open orders are in purple. Now, if we look closely at this item, you can see in the first two months, the forecast is actually below the open orders that we already have on hand. Now, this will be a problem. We already know we have firm orders for August and September that are higher than our current forecast, which means we will have an inventory problem. So to get around this, what we can do is we can create a calculated row that says, let's take whichever one is larger and use that number. So if my open orders are larger than my forecast, let's use my open orders. If not, if they are smaller, we'll continue to use the forecast. So we won't have these stock out issues. We can then use this calculated row to export in our numeric output in place of our final forecast to make sure we don't run into any of these stocking issues in our planning system. So how would we go about doing this? Okay, first, let's go ahead and right click again on our open orders and we will add a row. And once again, we're gonna add a global calculated row. I'm gonna call this largest forecast versus open orders. And so once again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in my formula here. So I'm gonna expand this over so we can see it. And I'm gonna say equals the max of my forecast and my open orders. And you will see here in this case, because my open orders were larger, that's what it is showing. So I'm gonna go ahead and once again, copy this, paste it across my entire forecast, and I'm gonna go ahead and commit this. Now you'll see we have a final row that takes the largest of our forecast versus our open orders. Once again, I wanna go back to my settings and you'll notice that I have created this at my SKU level. This is where I wanted it to appear, not at the bottom level, which is my customer. I want to calculate this at my SKU level. And once again, I want to pin this to my column because this is a formula that will cover the entire forecast period. So I'll go ahead and say, okay. I can also come over here onto the graph and go to the graph settings, and I can add this new calculated row that I created which is my largest forecast versus open orders. And I can actually remove the forecast here so I can see which one I'm actually using. So this is my largest, which is my forecast versus the open orders. This is what I will export in my numeric output and I won't run into any stocking issues. In our fourth and final example, we're gonna do a year over year comparison. We're going to use a calculated row to create a percentage difference from our current forecast to what happened at the same time last year to look at whether our forecast is growing or declining over time. In this final example, we're going to create a calculated row where we look at the difference between our forecast and what happened the same time last year. So for example, you can see here, my current forecast for August is 2,500 units. Last year, I forecasted 2,200 units, so I'm up from last year. But how much am I up? And I want to look at these changes, and in this case, I'm going to do it as a percentage. So to do this, once again, I'm going to right-click on my forecast. I'm going to add a row, and we're just going to call this percent difference year over year. And once again, I will want this to be a global uh, calculation so I can see this on all items. So once again, I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna create my formula. Now this formula is gonna be a little bit more complex. I could just look at the percent difference, 
but I also want to compensate for the fact that last year might have been zero. And this is a common issue that people run into, which is that they do simple formulas. And if they have a zero either in their forecast or in the history, they'll end up with these errors. And when we aggregate this up, you'll end up with the same problem throughout. So to get around that, we're gonna use a slightly more complicated formula this time. In this case, we're gonna do an if statement, which we're gonna basically say if our histfc minus 12. So if our history or forecast from 12 months ago, which is last year, is greater than zero, then we're gonna do our formula. Otherwise, we're gonna just put in a zero because we're gonna put that in as our option. So the formula that we are going to use is we're gonna compare our histfc minus our history 12 months ago divided by our parentheses. Otherwise, we're just gonna put in a zero if this were zero behind us. And we'll go ahead and say, okay. And there we go, there's our formula. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this and paste it throughout the entire forecast period. Now what you'll notice, of course, is that it says it's zero. And that's because this is not a number, it's a percentage, and it's a very small percentage. So I'm gonna go ahead and commit this. Then we're gonna go over to our settings, and we're gonna make a couple of setting changes. The first is that we're going to change this from a number to a percent. And then next, once again, we're gonna to go to our row properties and change this from date to column. And we're gonna go ahead and say okay. And now we can see the data as a percentage. And so we can actually see the change that we're 15% up from last year, 16% up, 3% down here, etc. Now the other thing that's important to note when we do a percentage formula is that the reconciliation won't work the same as with hard numbers. So if we go over here to the row properties, instead of calculating this at a specific level and then aggregating or disaggregating it, what we actually want to do is we want to set the calculation to all levels so that it will independently calculate this formula at all levels. And that's because these won't roll up. You know, if I have a bunch of items that have a 10% difference, I don't wanna have a 50% difference up at my group. I wanna calculate the group difference on its own. So we are going to calculate this independently at all levels. This way, when we go about looking at our data at different levels, we will see the percent change at whatever level we have clicked on. This is a very useful function to see, and it's very good to visually see, are we growing, are we declining, and by how much when working in the tool. And this will give us guidance as to whether we should raise or lower the forecast when we're making our own direct overrides. Now let's run through some conclusions. Majority of companies use Forecast Pro use the override grid. It's just a fact of life. As we've shown throughout today's webinar, we can use this override grid to gather information from multiple sources and use that information to make the best overrides possible. Being able to use Forecast Pro as a consolidation point is one of the main benefits of the tool and allows you to bring in all of this outside information, make the appropriate call, and make the best possible overrides that you can. Now, as we talked about at the beginning, we do run this webinar once a quarter with our next webinar being in November, and we're going to be talking about events. You can sign up on our website at forecastpro.com events, which is kind of a coincidence. And my colleague Franklin is going to post a direct link in the chat right now that you can use to go ahead and sign up for November's webinar. So if you want to see more of these free webinars, please follow that link and sign up now. Also, as mentioned before, in the chat functionality, if you have come across any questions that you would like to ask right now, please use the chat. Franklin has been monitoring it throughout the webinar today, but we're going to answer questions now. If we don't get to your questions, don't worry. Please, we will follow up with emails afterwards to help answer any questions that you have. And with that, let's jump into the questions.